Welcome, everyone, to the Sports Illustrated Media Podcast. I am your host, Jimmy Trainer. Thanks so much for listening. Big show today. Good show. We got two guests. First up, Linda Cohn from ESPN. Linda just uh, resigned with ESPN. She has been there anchoring Sports Center for 30 years. So we have a very fun conversation with Linda about all of her time there at ESPN and, and doing Sports Center for all those years. Following Linda Cohen, former head writer for WWE Monday Night Raw and SmackDown, Brian Gerwertz. He has a book coming out. He wrote for The Rock, Mick Foley, Chris Jericho, Edge Christian during the uh, beginning of the Attitude Era into the PG Era, 1999 to 2012. And he has all of the sort of backstage. He was the head writer for those shows when WWE was at its peak. So it's a really interesting behind the scenes look at the world of WWE with um, Brian there. And then following that, of course, train of thoughts with my buddy Sal Licata. Before we get to it, just a quick reminder, if you missed any recent episodes, last week was our 400th episode of the SI Media Podcast. So we did a little celebration. Also spoke to Alan Sepinwall, the chief television critic for Rolling Stone about what you should be watching this summer. Two weeks ago, John O'Ran and Dave Meltzer were on the podcast. Three weeks ago, Peter Schrager. So check those out if you missed them. And uh, if you leave a review, we will read it most likely next week. Leave a review on Apple, and I'll read it during the Train of Thoughts segment next week right here on the SI Media Podcast. All right, so like I said, Linda Cohn from ESPN, followed by the former head writer for WWE, Brian Gerwitz, followed by Train of Thoughts on this episode of the SI Media Podcast. Here we go. All right, joining me now, legendary ESPN personality, just re-signed with the company and has been there for 30 years, so it was a perfect opportunity to get her on the SI Media Podcast. Linda Cohen. Linda, how are you? Jimmy, great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, continued success on this podcast, by the way. Great stuff out of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Does it feel like you've been at ESPN for 30 years? No, uh, it does not. I mean, you know, you've been in this business a long time. Uh, it just, I don't know, you just put your head down and go, right? I mean, you're just doing something you love. You love sports. I'd be caring and loving uh, sports, even if I wasn't in this business. It's always been a part of my DNA back in the day when my dad just got me interested in it. And I'd sit in the couch and watch games with him and have something to look forward to as a kid with low self-esteem growing up as sports gave me that you know just looking forward to a Met game looking forward to a Ranger game looking forward to watching the Giants with my dad and stuff like that so um when you think about an ESPN career for 30 years I never would have thought it I wasn't counting even though my wonderful bosses especially one Norby Williamson was counting how many sports centers I did once upon a time and realized I did more than anybody and we had a 5,000 show and had some of my you know, legendary heroes on the show, like, you know, like uh, Mark Messier before he was an ESPN employee. Um, so that was kind of a big deal. Uh, so, yeah, it just goes so fast, Jimmy. You know this, as yeah. you get older, everything goes fast. Now, you know, I do feel like sports fans, I know this, I feel this way. I feel like the sports fans who are, who are of a certain age, we, ha we still to this day have a certain affinity for the old school sports center. Obviously, the media landscape has changed enormously, but yes. there was that period of time where SportsCenter was where you went to get every highlight, all the news, all the information. So, you know, I think it's kind of fascinating that you were there for that and now you're there for sort of this um, edition of it. Take me through what those early days were like, though. And, and I mean, the, you know, we had the commercials and, and the ESPN, yeah. the SportsCenter pers personalities became pop culture personalities take me yeah. through a little bit of, of that era yeah no i'm really glad you bring that up because those were special times and i know we all sound old when we look back and say that was better than it what is now it's just different because as you mentioned it was the only game in town so you knew once you were hosting sports center the oddballs were on you <laughs> and it kind of got uh, speaking for myself it got me even extra super fired up you know with frosting on top because i knew People were watching and I couldn't screw up, you know, I mean, and back then, I mean, it was, you know, I was doing a, a sports center nightly on the late show, which was the go-to sports center, even after the 11 o'clock Eastern. So I come on at 1 a.m. Eastern, 2 a.m. Eastern. And I knew, you know, of course, half the viewers might be drunk or doing other things, but I was on in the background, you know what I mean? And I, I could tell you some stories there, but if you talk about, uh, 
<laughs> oh, I want to hear those. Company and what I've seen. I always remember this story, and I don't think Scott Van Pelt remembers this, but I sure do. But, okay. Well, there was a meet, and you know, and Scott came later. Really, I mean, we can go even go the pre Scott Van Pelt, but um, so way back when I couldn't even put a year on it. But if you look it up, you can see uh, when it was when I tell you the subject matter. So. Um, it was such a nice little community we had that when there was something big happening or something was going to change on Sports Center, you know, the bosses would hold a talent meeting and, you know, and we'd all get together in a small conference room back then. And I'll always remember, and I think it was Mark Gross, who's still there today. I believe he was up at the, you know, up on stage telling us this new thing that they were going to introduce to Sports Center, and they were going to call it the bottom line. And the reason why I bring up Scott Van Pelt, of course, by now we know what the bottom line is. It's like part of the Bible of uh, sports TV. (laughs) It's the scroll at the bottom of the screen that tells you already the final scores of games. Okay, because that's how it started. Like, okay, here are all the final scores of games. And then Mark Gross was telling us all that this bottom line was going to roll during Sports Center. So I remember we were like, wait, what? I mean, I thought you care about how we present our on-camera lead-ins, which is what we write, to present this big game and to build up this anticipation uh, to, and they get the audience involved, even though one of these teams weren't, you know, they couldn't care less about them. And so Scott, I remember standing up, and when he stands up, he's even taller, uh, and he's standing up, and he, and he said, he, to his credit, he put on such a great debate, just saying, wait a minute. I mean, he was saying everything we were thinking, like, how are we telling people the score before they see the highlights? You know, that doesn't make any sense. Right. We're going to be, you know, spoil. It's like a, a great movie. And obviously you telling, that's me now talking, telling right. the end of the movie before I saw the whole movie. What are you doing? And we had no choice. We had no say. We did it. And like the rest is history. And that's just one example, you know, you tell yeah. young people this and you're like, wait, what? it wasn't a yeah. bottom line before. I remember, you know, it's funny. I, in doing a little bit of research, I saw that at one point you had worked for sports channel, which oh, was way back new, when. Yeah. yeah. Was a new, and I, re, I think they were the first ones that had the score box up because I remember in college when I would place wagers, that was where I would go to get the scores because they had the box going yeah. continually. They didn't do a scroll. They had an like a, it's almost like the box you see like on Fox during an NFL game. Like that was the box yeah. that was on sports channel. Yeah. And um, that was before that. It was not a scroll. It was, it was way ahead of its time. Yeah, it sure was. And to your point, you mentioned wagers and things. Yeah. Back in the day, one of my first jobs um, when I was trans, you know, when I was going into sports after I did news updates at WALK Radio in Patchogue and volunteered to cover Islander games, which at that time was painful um, because I'm a Ranger fan. But that's but that led me to a lot of networking. And that was like really a blessing to do that for free. And they only paid for my gas. But I started freelancing in many other places in sports, you know, to get my experience and let people know I knew what I was talking about, how much I love sports, just like they did. So I worked for Sports Phone. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but that was in New York. And I worked for them, too. For betters. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I and worked you go for them, too. Little phone booth for your viewers and listeners who don't know it. You go in this little phone. Maybe you talked about it. Little phone booth. Right, Jimmy? And yep. you're just like. You're on for 40 seconds and you're literally just reading scores. Yep. And this was actually when I did it, I'm dating myself, but I don't care. <laughs> it's before sports talk radio, you know? And so this was a valuable tool yeah. for whether it's, you know, a better or an avid sports fan. I think there was two. I think there was sports phone and score phone. I worked, oh. I think at score phone. I worked, it was in Elmont. I don't know where the one you were. I was at. in New York City and I worked okay, for so sports there were, phone. Okay, so there were two different ones, but it was the same thing where we I'd go in a little closet yeah. almost, read the scores, go back yes. out 10 minutes later, back in the closet to read the scores. Yeah. Bingo. Yeah. And it was a very <laughs> fun job. I yeah, love that funny, job. It's funny when you yeah. tell people. Yeah. Did you like that? I loved that job. Did you like yeah, it? Yeah. I, I love the job. I'll tell you why I love that job. I work with so many great people. And, you know, that was when, I mean, let's face it, I'll, I'll date myself. I'll tell you the exact... Uh, years that was in the 80s okay right. so that was in the 
um, I graduated college in 81. That was like in 84, 85. That's when I started doing freelancing for them, among other places. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about it, I mean, I was the only woman, of course. And there was like four other guys at the time, and it was late night. And we're sitting around watching TV, and you'd see games on certain TVs, but another channel, they'd have the Playboy channel on. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, okay, that's part of the territory, whatever. You know, I just go through every 10 minutes, go in my little room and check out the, the, uh, the, not the, the, the wire, like the AP wire, right. <laughs> looking, getting the latest uh, scoreboards off of that. And, but it was just a different world, different life, but it was something that I'll, I'll always cherish yeah. those fun times. It's a, it's a perfect story to summarize the eighties that you were at work and the playboy <laughs> channel was on it, it's yeah. perfectly, perfectly eighties. Whereas now people would be, the whole company would be shut yeah, down. Be and fired. Oh, don't even. Yeah. 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 Well, that wouldn't, they wouldn't be a playboy channel, right? I don't I, even know right. when they close that down. Exactly. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. You, you so you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but I'm just curious. Do you, I don't want to say, do you have a favorite, but who were some of the partners you've had over the years anchoring sports center with that you had the most fun with, or you think back the most fondly and say, Oh, we had, you know, the chemistry with us was great. We had the most fun or this time period with this anchor was a, a blast. What, what, who comes to mind if I ask you that? Yeah. You know what? It, 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 you're not putting me on the spot. There's just so many, like even, you know, I, I, I'll answer that question. Yeah. It's just, you know, like the days of, you know, Rich Eisen and Stuart Scott. I mean, I got to work with both those guys a lot. They were amazing. They were fun. You know, Rich would always make me laugh. Uh, Kenny Maine always made me laugh. He didn't have to say anything. He just would look at me <laughs> while I'm reading something. And his look, right. <laughs> just, you know, I just saw it in the corner of my eye and he made me crack up. Now, of course, you know, making me crack up is an easy thing. But Kenny's a funny man. He's just a great right. human. Um, but then even like, you know, the John Butcher Grass, we had great chemistry, the hockey, you know, we, and just weaving in and out. I would always say the key to a good sports center co-host is that you work together, right? You know, you just have the chemistry right now. I've been, you know, I've been out in LA for five years and I work a lot with Neil Everett. Neil and I have tremendous chemistry. We're like cut from the same cloth. We always get music involved in the show. We're just throwing things over the highlights before we... You know, I, I kind of the other day just got to turn the page from way back when in my past. I I love music growing up, like pop music. I was one mm. of those kids that not only sports, I mean, at eight years old, I, you know, was listening to AM radio and, and all the pop news, pop stuff. So the grassroots and, and three dog night were at a fair in Orange County. <laughs> And I told Neil this, that I went to see him. And of course, he knew everything and he knew these, right. these bands. And I'm like, and then before I knew it, when doing the show that night, you know, we're, we're referencing, you know, all these uh, Three Dog Night songs and a few grassroots songs. People thought we were from Mars. I don't know. But so we let don't me ask care. You, let so me the ask point you this, is if that you're, you're go perfect co-host is someone that you can have laughs with. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. No, no, I was going to say, um, I, you know, the the... I was going to use the word old time, but I don't mean it. In, I mean it in a respectful way. The old time sports center anchors, That's every, okay. all of them have yeah. like that on air moment. That is, I mean, what it would be considered now viral back then. That wasn't a word, but whether it's Charlie Steiner laughing with the Carl Lewis, um, Steve Levy with the bulging dick. Do you have one on air uh, you know, story like that for yourself where yeah. it was? Good. I don't ha I don't have anything as big as those kind of, uh, uh, you know, blemishes. I don't even want to say there were blemishes for those two, because obviously they have great careers. And Charlie's gone on to even greater things, obviously, with his baseball play by play. And, you know, Steve Levy, you know, good friend. I mean, what can you say about him? He could do anything play. He could. I tell him that all the time. I, I don't even know why he's still the sports center at times. I go, you should just stick to play by play. You're amazing at that in yeah. every sport. Um, but I never, I, I don't. And uh, I mean, maybe just my laughs. I mean, I had something that go, I don't know what defines viral anymore, but this thing kept on showing just Neil and I, we couldn't get through the hi, hello, welcome to sports center. It happened about three weeks ago and uh, someone was rolling on it and they put that up there. It's just because I, I couldn't catch my breath. So it was sort of like the Charlie moment right. uh, for now for me, but right. I never had anything where like I mispronounced something or all that. Yeah. You've referenced hockey here a few times and you do 
outside of sports center, you do work on, on ESPN's NHL coverage. I would imagine there were pro- there's probably no one at the company happier than you when, when ESPN got the NHL back. Um, I guess they got it back two years ago, but last year was the first yeah, year. Yeah, I was happy. I mean, yet. right, right, right. I mean, I just feel that, you know, I just wanted to see what ESPN can do with this product and give them an opportunity to have it back again, but have a product in the National Hockey League. That to me is better than ever, bigger than ever, and personalities that you can sell and promote. Um, and you know, the first year, you know, ESPN learned a lot from that. I'm hoping to do more games. My big thrill was having an opportunity uh, multiple times to go between the benches, be at ice level, and you know, report from there during the game. That's so great. I mean, uh, to yeah. me, I was like, wow, at this stage of my career, I never thought I'd have that opportunity, and I only have that opportunity because ESPN got hockey back. So, and that's just so cool, you know, being in between the benches. And I mean, hey, I played at a much lower level. I played in high school and, and in college, but, you know, all those players grew up with me watching me on Sports Center. So it was really kind of fun. Did I get hit by it? Now, remember, I played goalie back in the day. And uh, I, the, the puck did get in my little, you know, four by four little thing there a few times, certain games. It seems like the puck always found me. Typical goalie complaint the puck always found me. It found right. me. One time it hit me, but it was it wasn't even a big. De- uh, it didn't. I don't know. It must have got a soft part of me, uh, but it didn't really bother me. But a couple of the players would come over. They're like, "You okay, Linda? You okay?" And I had to remind them that I was once a goaltender, <laughs> and I'm fine. And I had a, you know. And then the other times, you just you, you know, you're cool. You know, you just you, you the pucks on the floor. Okay, you hit me. Pucks on the floor. Go down. Get it up. Turn around. Throw it to the little kid that's standing mm-hmm. behind me. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> That's great that you got to go right. I mean, it, the coverage for hockey has changed so much, obviously, in that in that you know you get right on the ice basically now with with yeah. the reporting. Um, you know, there's there was a narrative out there when it, when ESPN didn't have the NHL for all those years that NHL that ESPN never covered the NHL and then they got it back and they started covering it. Were were those frustrating years for you as a hockey fan, or did you understand it's a business and we don't have it, so we're not going to cover it? Yeah, I mean, uh, you look at it both ways. I absolutely thought and knew, and I would tell people that when they would complain to me because it was like (laughs) therapeutic, you know, for that to happen, for them to complain to me like Linda would understand. She must be pulling her hair out. And I would say to them, listen, look what ESPN has done to uh, products they have owned and paid for. I always bring up the UFC. They helped build that into what that is now, like it or not. You know, we all know how big the UFC is. So I I said, listen, once ESPN gets hockey back, it's going to be a different story. You watch. And it was. And that's what I tried to look at. But when we didn't have the hockey, I couldn't control the other stuff. I couldn't control that all these other shows or other people who were doing SportsCenter, you know, weren't talking about hockey or wasn't in the rundown. But, you know, I did my part to always get hockey in the show, even if it wasn't in the rundown. And, you know, as you know, in this business, you can only can do things that you can control because it's a team effort. But sure, you know, I wasn't the only hockey fan that was frustrated, but, you know, we left the light on and the NHL came back. And thanks to Jimmy Pitaro, uh, you know, who runs ESPN the last few years, he's he was the big reason why uh, it came back because he's a big Rangers fan. He grew up a Rangers fan. And that was really important to him from the beginning once he took over to get the National Hockey League back on ESPN. Was there ever interest from NBC Sports or even, I don't know, maybe one of the Canadian stations that aired the NHL because you're known for being a hockey person or but did that never really even come to fruition? Yeah, you know, I, I kind of like, I mean, you know, maybe I'm loyal to a fault. Uh, but for me, raising kids and not moving them somewhere was really important to me. I have two grown kids. And there were times where I could have left ESPN. I chose not to because I was putting my role as a mom first. And maybe that's not, you know, the cool thing to say or whatever. But I'm so proud of that. That's the most important thing to me that I was able to raise two amazing children. Um, And so that was that's why I didn't really want to get up and move and move and move. And the grass isn't always greener sometimes. Uh, And also, if I wanted to move to Canada, there were times where I felt like moving to Canada. Not now. But, you know, in the past, I felt like moving to Canada because I just thought it was always so cool with TSN or, or, you know, Sportsnet that 
you know, their t- right. like TSNS Sports Center with the RE on the end of it. It would always like all the T's coming up on Sports Center. Everything would be a hockey play. And I'm like, that would be so cool, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. just doing that, right? Yeah, you know, for but, sure. Um, so, yeah. So that was really yeah. the reason why I didn't pursue anything or really, you know, become aggressive trying to leave ESPN. Because yeah. let's fix it. You know, sometimes we all know, you know, sure, maybe you can go back. But if there were other people involved in my life. Yeah. Well, I, I, you say that might not be the cool thing to say. I think it's a very cool thing to say. I, that well, thanks. There's absolutely. I mean, I think that's a wonderful thing to do. Um, I want to go. I want to talk about a little bit before you you got to ESPN. You mentioned Walk. You worked at Walk on Long Island, which is still a yeah. station here on Long Island, ninety seven point five. And did did you say you did news before, before sports? Yeah, yeah. And it was what, my first job out of college at Oswego State. Uh, there were no sports jobs and I didn't even think about it. Like I wanted that, you know, but I don't know, there wasn't anything. So I thought, Oh, you know what? I can hold my skills on radio. And that was an opportunity. And this wonderful man who's no longer with us, Frank Brinka, the news director. I don't know. I think he's no longer with us. I lost track. Maybe we don't say that, but uh, the point is this, uh, at WALK, they gave me a job as, you know, doing news updates. And it was, a. Uh, um, Again, the music station. So it had like, you know, I could hear my favorite Carpenters hits, you know, right. um, that I used to cry over when I was 11 <laughs> years old. And I could also hear Beatles and Bee Gees, you know what I'm saying? And then uh, work with some cool DJs and do these news updates. But then everyone would always say, Linda, when the sports comes on, you know, that little 30 seconds of the newscast, your your whole tone changed. Your whole, this is what people would say when they listen to me on the radio at WLK. And I'm like, well, there's a reason for that. I mean, news bores me, you know, sports does not. And so I asked in the, Frank Brinka, hey, can I, vol- I volunteered to cover the New York Islanders, which an hour from Patchogue, they paid for my gas. I got no extra money for it except for that. And that was really important and significant. And I tell young people all the time, Jimmy, you know, sometimes you really have to uh, go for these things. You don't have to, no, don't expect to get paid, but it's a chance to network. So that's where I met you know, the late great Ed Ingalls, who was just a legend uh, for WCBS AM radio at these Islander games. And he started putting me on some Met games, some US Open, just freelancing, radio reporting. And it really, really helped uh, me uh, keep going to the next level then working at ABC Radio Network and then covering two Olympics. Shelby Whitfield, uh, he has passed as well. He was, you know, I always say this, Jimmy, especially a woman like me, young woman getting into an all male business was all pre uh, ESPN is the fact that it was men, men who gave certain men in hiring positions saw something in me and gave me those opportunities, you know, to yeah. showcase it. And, uh, you know, yeah, there were no women in those hiring positions. I get that. But man, I am so eternally grateful for these guys because, again, we're talking early 80s, mid 80s, uh, you know, late 80s. And, you know, I got to ESPN by, you know, late 80, uh, 92 because I right. worked in Seattle and there was another great guy, John Lippman, news director, who hired me to be a sportscaster in Seattle, a TV, CBS affiliate. And so I covered the Mariners, you know, uh, the Sonics when they were there, Seahawks from 89 to 92. And then I, I went to ESPN and that's where ESPN saw me doing, you know, I was a sports anchor on TV for a CBS affiliate. And yeah, so the point is each of those steps that I took was because me just trying to like, you know, let someone else who's see that I know what I'm talking about. I love what I'm doing. And I'm not using it as a stepping stone to do something else. Right. To do to go back to news or to do entertainment. I actually wanted to do sports. People find that hard to believe sometimes. It's it, it's very interesting what you say there because I know this is a big theme on Twitter, which isn't real life. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. But yeah, people on Twitter flip out if you ever talk about working for free or, or working and not getting paid it, it seems to be like a big taboo thing and i i can get where those people are coming from but i think you have to take what business you're discussing and and apply it there because like you said whenever someone has asked me over all these years about you know how do you get to sports illustrated or how do you get into sports journalism media i always say and 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 I, you know i know this is maybe not the popular thing to say because you don't want it to be this way, but this right. is what I think is the truth. And the truth is this in this business, from what I've seen, who, you know, 
is just as important and in a lot of cases more important than what you know. So what you said about networking and making connections, I get where you don't want to work for free and that sets a bad precedent, but in the business we're in, I think it's all about who you know. I, I, maybe not all about, but 90% of it is this person works at you know this station, oh, we'll get a job. You know, I can get my friend in here, this, that. I mean, that's, that's how it works. At least that's my experience. Yeah, I, and that's a great point you brought up because uh, even at this stage of my career, um, the great news about like my new deal, I'm able to do some other things. Uh, like I've been for years filling in for Mad Dog Sports Radio for Christopher, uh, Mad Dog Russo on Sirius XM, um, filled in for a bunch of times for Pat McAfee. So I work, you know, fill, the reason why I bring that up is that sports talk has really helped me hone my skills in everything else that I do. Um, it's just, I don't have to tell you, Jimmy, you know, cause look at you with the podcast and everything else that you do, the talking thing and doing it without a, you know, like sports center, you always have that, you know, just in case I have a piece of paper down here, if the prompter goes out, right. But you know, sports talk, you're taking calls and they're asking who knows what the hell they're going to ask you, you know? So, you know, you have to know a way to answer it. If you don't know the answer, you got to figure out a way to do it. Um, but I, I, I really enjoyed that. And I don't do that for a lot of money. Trust me. <laughs> I right. Fill in. right. I, you know, right. You know, right. right. Like, Filling it on serious you know, is not going to pay the bills. No, but I really <laughs> love it. And people right. listen and it's helped me. It's helped my career. And I'm actually, um, in the infant stages and I've been pitching this, my son, Dan, who's 26 years old, but he sleeps NFL, eats drinks since he was seven years old. He was all about the NFL. And, you know, it has a lot to do with me. Um, and and so, um, but it's funny, Jimmy, I, we're, we are going to create something, um, whether it's podcasts or something. We're in the infant stages now of like mother and son, you know, Linda Cohn and, and her son, Dan. I don't know what the name of it yet is, but we're just figuring out the logistics now and who and what and why. And I'm, I'm throwing it out there in the universe because I think it's going to stick because there's nothing like it. I know there are a million NFL podcast but there's nothing with linda cone and her son dan right as you're um, talking so, i'm and, trying to think of like mother son podcasts and i i can't think of any so i see there you go jimmy yeah, you're right yeah. i mean and and you know but i, I mean i get to, well we get on the phone he lives in uh, hartford and i'm and he's actually a production assistant at espn and i'm proud of him because he doesn't have my last name it's my old married name and so he never mentioned who his mom was oh wow. so he got it on his own and i'm really i'm just so proud of him and, um, you know, and ESPN has tons of podcasts, so I don't even know if we're going to end up with them. Um, so we, you know, but my point is, is that when we get on the phone to say, how's it going? I'm in L.A. now, as you know, and he's in Hartford. Uh, you know, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, 98 percent of the phone calls about whatever the headlines are in the NFL. Right. Like today, we, re we, we reiterated how we can't stand Daniel Jones and how we never liked him and how this whole videotape of that, uh, that, that's going viral, not videotape, but a viral, mm -hmm. viral uh, throw that he had. And it's just hilarious to see other people finally seeing the light. And then you have the other people talking about, oh, my God, that's what training camp's for. Get off his case. It's not his fault. And so Dan and I would go back and all this, or whether it's, you know, you know, Jimmy G suddenly is like Tom Brady or Joe Montana, that every team wants Jimmy G. And right. I'm like, uh, you know, and then Dan would recite interviews. He told me today this this interview with Martellus Bennett that was he gave like years ago when he was one year on the Patriots, when he won the Super Bowl, about what Jimmy G was really like and compared to Jacoby Brissett. And Dan was like reciting this. And I'm like. It just reaffirmed that this is going to be a good idea. But yeah. mothers, so it's like, it's almost like someone eavesdropping on our phone conversation. Right, right. Yeah, it's, that's a, I'm, I can't think of a mother-son podcast. So I think you'd have I to know, right? market even cornered on, another, on that. Another subject even. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway. It's funny, you mentioned doing Sirius XM and, and filling in. Yeah. For Russo, McAfee. Um, I, I, I've always wondered this because I've heard you fill in here and there because I always listen to Sirius and I always wonder... I always thought ESPN, they didn't like their people sort of going outside the ESPN family there. Is that like a special thing you get permission for or is it you don't have to worry about ESPN in that I case? Think, uh, I, yeah, I'm not doing anything illegal in their mind. They all, yeah. They've known since the beginning and they've given me the go ahead. You know, it'd be different if ESPN radio used me. That'd be different. Like if right. suddenly one of their ESPN radio talents are like doing other stuff. Yeah, if I'm ESPN, I'm like, what are you doing? We gave you a show, <laughs> right. but I didn't even have those opportunities there. And so they, you know, kudos to them. They let me do this. They know 
you know, it's it's not threatening the, the worldwide leader in any way. And and honestly, like I told you, you know, it's made me a better broadcaster, honestly. Why, why do you if, think? If, if more businesses, you know, in our business, right, in broadcasting, who are guys that can make decisions, realize that, that you can make your property better at what they do by allowing them freedom to do things that aren't threatening. Let's be the make that clear, you know, aren't threatening to what, you know, their product is. And and that's why for years, I don't, not everyone has this. I think, I think they've been open to it. I mean, I think, I mean, look at some of these deals. I don't, I can't, I don't have it in front of me, but mm. the more I see it, the more I know that there are some other ESPN employees that are doing their own podcasts outside of ESPN or, you know, Kirk Herbstreet's doing his thing outside of, you know, ESPN. Right still doing his pants. So I think the, um, it's become a little bit, uh, you know, less stringent, yeah. which I think is, is good. And it's good. You know, everyone's happy that way. Why do you think ESPN radio never gave you a shot? They did early on. I don't know. I, I don't know. I really, you know, maybe early on they had a different um, philosophy, uh, culture. And, and here's the thing. What I love about Sirius, no offense to ESPN radio, but it's their, it's the way they're set up. It's too many commercials. It yeah. drove me up the wall. Oh. Um, I mean, I remember filling in for Ryan Rosillo when he worked for ESPN and others there. Every two seconds, I couldn't finish a point. I had a break for a commercial. Yeah. And also, I love taking calls on Sirius. You don't take calls, at least the shows that, you know, right. that I filled in for on ESPN. So I just think the format was different and the format Sirius was better catered to what I was trying to do, just talking. I mean, when I start a show, I talk for the first half hour. I don't yeah. even know what the hell I talk about half the time, but I just go, bah, 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 bah. and then I look and I'm like, oh, great, we can take our first break. And I killed a half hour. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. You know, that so doesn't happen on ESPN. couldn't do that radio. on ESPN radio. So I don't think yeah. it was anything significant other than it wasn't really meshing with my right. style. Right. I want to go back to something you said earlier. But of course, you no one ever communicated. But of course, Jimmy. Yeah. But of course, Jimmy, no one ever communicated the real reasons. <laughs> I don't know. So you don't know. Do you think yeah. the other real reasons? Um, I want to go back to something you said earlier about when you started out um, at WALK, uh, you did news and everyone said you sort of perked up when you were doing the sports part of it. And there's an interesting story, I guess. I, yeah. I mean, I first saw it on your Wikipedia page and then I, I, I've seen you speak about it, about when you first got to ESPN after a few months, someone came to you and said, it looks like you're not into sports and they gave you a... a a video trainer in a way. What? Tell me what that whole story and deal yeah, was. Yeah, it wasn't a few months. It was. It was. I was there for two years. Okay. I was hired in July of ninety two, and then it was in nineteen ninety four. Okay, when uh, I was told two of my uh, two guys that I totally respect, always have, uh, wanted to see me after the six p.m. Eastern edition of Sports Center. And I had no idea what it was about. And I would go in, and they were John Walsh and uh, Steve Anderson, two great guys, two big reasons. But they are the ones that brought me into Sports Center and hired me. And so in that office that day, it was like a shot to the gut I did not expect, blindsided for sure. They told me, hey, Linda, we know you love sports. We hear you talk about it in the newsroom when you're talking to your colleagues, this, that. We hear that excitement and that joy. We'd like to hear that more on the show. This was the first feedback, good or bad, I had ever received wow. about my performance two years in. So you can see how why I was like, wait, what? I thought you liked what I was doing. I thought this was what you wanted because I didn't hear anything to the contrary. Right. And then like suddenly that New Yorker in me was building up of like, <laughs> okay, you're either going to be really upset and raise your voice and have a very unprofessional tone while talking to two bosses in their office and you're going to sound like you're getting on the defensive or you're probably going to break down in tears because you didn't see this coming and you're taking it personally. So I held it all together and I just sort of <laughs> nodded and shook my head. I'm like, oh, okay. And I just couldn't believe what was happening in that moment. We've all had those moments right. where something has taken us by surprise and we're like, is this really happening? I didn't see this coming. How do I handle this? What should I do? And what I did was when I left that room, and that's when they said they'll hot, they hired this Andrea Kirby, who will sit with me and go over my highlights and kind of point out things. And I said, okay. And so within a few months, they said, okay, you don't need Andrea Kirby anymore. This is it. You're good. 
I'm so, good. So, so then they picked up my then they picked up my option because they basically said if I, they gave me an ultimatum. I almost left out the uh, you know the headline. Um, they gave me an ultimatum because I, I was there two years and I had an option. I had an option uh, for one more year, and and they said if I, we don't see improvement in six months, then we're not going to pick up that option. And I'm like, okay. And so I was real. I was very upset. I, I think I broke down in tears, and the ladies were in my car on the way home. So, so did I you didn't see that coming. So. So you do feel like the video coach in the end ended up helping. Absolutely. It's a, absolutely. What I like, found interesting. Great. I mean, I reconnect. I recon. Yeah. Go ahead. You go. You go. Yeah. I reconnected with her like on LinkedIn or something because she was working on some project. She reached out to me and I'm like, wow, I'm so glad Andrea you reached out to me. I'm glad, you know, I hadn't talked to her in like 20 years. She reached out to me like a few years ago um, regarding something she was working on. And, um, yeah, we kind of reminisced about those days and yeah, but she did help me because she helped me like be more me. Um, I was so conscious at that time, Jimmy, of not letting out like my accent, not letting it not, you know, I wanted to be conversational. I felt I didn't, I couldn't be right. I got it reversed. It was actually like, yeah, you should be conversational. Right. You right. should, you know, don't force anything and don't try to be like anybody else. Yeah. And so we would go over the highlights and how to do that. And also just less words, you know, less words, uh, let the pictures do the story, tell the story, stuff like that. Jimmy. Yeah. It sounds like you were just maybe overthinking it in the beginning really is really what it came yeah. down to. It, but it was, it, what, what struck me when I read it was, so when I first read it, I said, the, my first reaction was like, well, that's really crummy to call someone into an office, say it doesn't sound like you like sports, straighten up. And then I, then when I thought about it a little, I said, well, it, it, in a way, it's almost, I don't, I don't want to use the word compliment, but they obviously thought highly of you that they didn't let yeah. you go at that time and they brought in someone to help you. So yes. on the surface, it sounded bad, but then it ended up being a good thing. So it's, it's a weird thing how this business and works. And by like the that. way, it's interesting when we, think, when, we think, when we were talking earlier about time periods and how things change. Yeah. That's exactly how I took it after I stopped taking it personally. And I realized that, wait a minute, these guys are trying to help me be better. They yeah. see something in me, like all those past male bosses I referred to earlier. These guys are the same. They see something in me and they have the, uh, the team to make it better. And you would think if something like that, who knows if that happened nowadays to someone, you know, type of thing. It might have been a different reaction. Yeah. But I looked at it as helpful. Like they really do. They really do like me. You know, they really right. want me to be the person they think I am. And and it didn't take long for them to realize that. Like I said, a couple of months with working with her once or twice a week, and boom, it was. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just about communication, Jimmy. Right. Right. If someone would just tell, like, tell me. Right. What they're looking for in anything like you know yeah. even now to this day i do that jimmy like when uh, you know like i'll say like i'll say this like covering hockey um in between the benches right that was something new so i would t ask the producer or i'd say what's your perfect <clears throat> what's your perfect world what would you like me you know if you're sitting at home what would you like me to uh say or do or act right. or that because like it's the more information i tell this to young people all the time the more information you take in you can just filter it out, sort it out and say, OK, now I know what you're looking at. OK, I, I wonder if it's a New York thing that because I'm this I always tell, you know, I write a daily column for SI and I, I've had many editors over the years and producers for the podcast. And I always, like I always say, just tell me straightforward, plain English, like I, I'm not going to be upset if you say this is a bad column yes. or this is a bad. I'd rather you say this is bad. Change right. it instead of like, well, I think the words here could be maybe moved around. A d d just say it and I'll move on. I can to handle it. Maybe right. it's a New York thing. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, wanna, I don't know. But isn't it interesting? Because now the people in those positions, they're, they have to be gentle. Right. right? But we right. as New Yorkers, right. we're like, okay, just tell me. I'll adjust. Right. 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 Um, I want to go back before we wrap up. You had said when you started out, it was men who took a chance on you, gave you opportunities, gave you jobs in the last you know, few years here in sports media specifically. There's been a big 
emphasis to get more representation in sports media. Um, you mentioned it. We need more women, minorities in charge and hiring. It's not just on camera. How do, have you seen the changes? Do you feel like it's gone in a positive direction? Do you still think we're woefully behind? As someone, I'm, no one could probably speak on this better than you, 30 years at ESPN. Where do you think that, how much have you seen the improvement, if at all, over the last few years? Uh, Jimmy, there's definitely been uh, improvement. There Can there be more improvement in this situation? Absolutely. In what areas? Well, in those hiring positions, like women should be given that freedom, put in those positions in management where they're not just sitting in the meeting room listening to the men talk about the decisions they've made, but actually be the one that makes the decision um, at hiring. Um, because, yeah, it's sad, but it's just the time period where I broke into this business. It, that's why I say it was men, certain men who saw something in me who gave me the opportunity. I'm sure there'd be women who saw something in me and gave me the opportunity if they were in those positions. So are we moving in the right direction to answer your question? Absolutely, yes. Uh, do we have a ways to go? Absolutely, yes. And it's just so wonderful to see so many, you know, young women joining so many talented, great young men in this business with so much to share. And, and what I love, Jimmy, is that they're creating, we have all these great platforms now in this day and age, in the last decade with social media, YouTube, all of it, uh, where you can create your own stage and you don't have to send out VHS tapes like I did back in the day. Right. Um, you know, that's how I got that job in Seattle, a year of sending out tapes. Um, but here, you know, you can showcase your stuff on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, TikTok, whatever you want to do. And that's what I tell young people all the time. I mean, yeah. it's there for you, you know, go after it. And you could always go back to that boring job or go to a boring job, but you won't be happy unless you really work. And that's the other thing. I think, you know, that's why they call it work. I mean, you know, they don't call it luck. Right. You have to work, right. you have to work right. at it, you know, in all ways, be, be a better talent and also work at networking and work at reaching out. I, there's so yeah. many people that I don't even know have reached out to me on LinkedIn and other areas where I try to get back to them and I'm pretty good at getting back to them, but they ask for advice. And the first thing I tell them is like, you know, kudos to you for thinking of reaching out to me and maybe I respond, maybe I don't. I said, yeah. keep doing that everybody, you know? Uh, and so there are ways for people who are breaking in right now who can really uh, make an impact, but uh, we're going in the right direction with, with uh, a women in sports, but now we got to get them in hiring in positions where they hire. Well, 30 years is, is an amazing run in any business, but especially in sports media and at ESPN where, I mean, the changes in sports media over 30 years are just, you know, incredible as, as we went into the sort of internet digital age and now streaming age and everything changes and you're still there, just resigned. And um, if I asked you, if I was still doing this podcast in 10 years, would I have you on for the 40th anniversary of your time at ESPN? You think uh, it's in the future? Uh, probably not. Probably not, to give you an odd, but it doesn't mean, but it won't mean I'm in retirement either. Right. So let's just right. leave it at that. Well, I listen, mean, why that's, stop? Right. right. There's, you don't, you can do what you said it, you can do whatever you want sort of in, in the media scope these days with so many avenues. So. Even if you right. retire, I mean, you can still work. Yeah. I just heard Joe Beningo yeah. here on WFN retired, and now he's coming back to do like shows on Saturdays. Like there's no such thing as retirement in sports media, I feel like. Not at all. And I love that. I saw that news yeah. too. We all yeah. love Joe Beningo. Yeah. I, you know, he's a great guy. I've known him. I, I, one of those 5 million jobs I had freelancing was at WFAN where Joe and my paths cross. So yeah. he, he's a legend on the fan, as you know, Jimmy. Yes, absolutely. Just seems like people in sports media retire and then get another job, some sort of, you know, easier yeah. job. And it, that's, you know, it's good. It's good. Keep busy, stay busy and keep doing I don't think know. they want to be at home. I think a lot of these people just don't want to be at home. <laughs> that was my theory with Tom Brady. That's for sure. Oh, Tom, that's for sure. But that's Tom a blessing had, to all of us. Yeah. Tom had a month at home and said, I think I'll, eh. I think I'll, I think I'll have Aaron Donald knock me out a little bit instead. So, um, 
Hey, I love it. That's yeah. great. I yeah. was a sad day when he announced his retirement. So it's great that he's here and Tom, back. It's great. Tom is great for our business and what we do. That's for sure. Um, I appreciate you coming on. Congrats on the 30 years. And uh, we will, uh, as always, still keep watching on Sports Center. Thanks for coming on, Linda. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. And like I said at the top, continued success for you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks. Take care. All right. Joining me now, looking forward to this. Uh, he is a former head writer for the WWE. Now has a book coming out called There's Just One Problem. And with everything going on in WWE right now, and then obviously going back to the Attitude Era, which was when it, when it was at its peak, there's a lot to discuss. His name is Brian Gerwitz. Brian, how's it going? Good, Jimmy. It's uh, <laughs> it's technically Gerwitz, but Gerwitz. I, I, I knew I was going to do that. I in my head, I was like Gerwitz, Gerwitz. I knew because I, I know on something to wrestle with Bruce oh, Pritchard yeah. and Conrad, your name, the pronunciation of your last name is a big topic. Bruce takes uh, great pride in pronouncing yeah. it the wrong way. So that so, was in my head, and that helped cause me to yeah, mess no up. Problem. Uh, so this is my first time ever interviewing an actual head writer for WWE, which is obviously a fascinating job. And what you detail in your book comes out. Give us the exact date the book comes out so people know and they can get it. Uh, August 16th. There you go. Uh, and it's available for pre-order on Amazon and all the other places now. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's coming up. So let's just start with a little background here just to sort of set the stage. You were, I just want to make sure I have this correct. You were in WWE from 1999 to 2012. So I was full-time at WWE from, yeah, November 99 through October 2012. And then uh, I stayed on as a consultant working part-time for WWE and part-time for Seven Bucks Productions from end of 2012 through uh, middle of 2015 and from 99 to 2012 were you how much of how much of that time were you were you a head writer were you a head writer the entire time or just part partial for probably a good 10 years i think i think officially was like promoted to head writer in i like to say may of 20 of 2002 and then kind of kept that until 2012 mm-hmm. before I segue into the consulting. And you mentioned Seven Bucks Production. That is Dwayne The Rock Johnson's company. And you have developed, I guess, a very tight relationship with Dwayne, which we can get into and in, in sort of how that all developed. But I, I want to f- talk about writing for WWE. Well, let me just start with this. For the book, uh, there's just one problem. How much of the curtain do you pull back in the book? You know, I wanted to tell like an honest tale. I didn't want it to do a, I'm not really interested in doing like a airing dirty laundry type of thing because I really don't have dirty laundry. Um, You know, not everything went smooth. Not everything was like a day at the beach. Uh, But for the most part, it was you know pretty exhilarating. So like if you're going to just, you know, if it's going to be all like, anger and bile like i don't know if anyone you know that's not the story i want to tell maybe some right. people read that right. and maybe it works for others uh and if it, everything is just all rosy and and then this person is great and then this happened and it was tremendous i mean that kind of has a very you know inauthentic feel as well so i just kind of wanted to tell you know honest story because honestly it was a bit of a roller coaster there were like highs there were lows there were times I got along great with talent and with the McMahons and everything else. There were times where, you know, the relationship was frayed a little bit, but it all came back in the end. So overall, though, it was a very, very positive experience from a, the working experience and just a life experience. So I really just wanted to capture all those elements in the book. All right. So let me start with this. T- tell, let's start right from the beginning. Tell me how you get a job with WWE in 1999, how old you were, how it all happened, and, and then how you ended up becoming head writer. So, you know, there's extenuating circumstances back then because uh, it's not like the process it is today. You know, it, just to, for context, like the process today, I'm not even sure exactly. I can give you the process up till 2015 was, you know, people interviewing, sending in samples, you know, having a meeting with perhaps one of the head writers or creative elements or what have you and then doing it. When I started, um, you know, there were two writers at the time. Um, 
I interviewed with them. Well, actually, let me backtrack. I was a I was a sitcom writer in L.A. with um, various degrees of success. You know, the sitcoms I wrote and weren't exactly Emmy nominated, but they were fun to work on. I mean, I was in my mid twenties. It was an exhilarating, great experience to be. G- able give to- us a couple of sitcoms you worked on, just out of curiosity. So, uh, Jenny, the Jenny McCarthy sitcom right. on NBC. Um, the uh, Big Wolf on Campus on Fox Family. Um, which, thank you, I appreciate the nod. I know uh, mm-hmm. most people have never heard of it. Although I've heard of one out of the two, 50%, yeah. not bad, five, batting uh, 500. There was a show called Claude's Crib on the USA Network that was, you know, when they were doing sitcoms, which was my first job with my writing partner. Uh, we were part of a Paramount Writers Program, and we got placed on that show. Um, so, you know, you're, you're you know, getting uh, experience and, you know, moving up the ladder and, you know, be able to write on Jenny which was NBC, um, you know, when, when I was 24 or whatever, um, wild. It was, was tremendous, even if the show wasn't, you know, necessarily a success. Um, you know, after that got canceled, I was, you know, my writing partner and I, you know, we had to, it's the nature of the beast out there. You got to get your next gig and it's not a given no matter, you know, it's not as that we were like, you know, had all this tremendous quote unquote heat from coming off of Jenny. Um, so, it had been, you know, it had been for, for, for me way too long, you know, it had been almost a year before an, another job opened up. And in the meantime, uh, my sister, who was interning at MTV, said, hey, look, you're in L.A., I'm in New York, there's a whole bunch of WWF, uh, I'll just say WWE for the sake of yeah. <laughs> you know, continuity and stuff, uh, SummerSlam specials, we need a writer on it. Uh, you know, she knew, obviously, that I was a big fan I said, yeah, what am I doing? I'm not doing anything else. So I um, wrote a bunch of samples. I got hired. Uh, you know, within that time, I was writing five shows for MTV for the WWF 1999 SummerSlam week. Uh, one of them was to write the music video favorites of Triple H, Mankind, and The Rock. So I had to write scripts in those voices. Um, you know, and that really went well. That's where I met Dwayne for the first time and really hit it off. He, you know, liked what I had written. He was like, hey, this is pretty good. You ever consider writing for WWE, uh, which I never had. I didn't know, you know, how that worked. And, and it was a whole coastal move and everything. I was living in L.A. at the time. So I figured, what the hell, uh, I'll interview with them. Um, they presented me with a bunch of interviews with the two writers that they had on staff then, with Shane McMahon, with Vince and Linda McMahon, which Linda had a meeting, so it was only Vince. Um, you know, and all those interviews, and I, you know, I detail it, but they all... For the only only the Vince interview went well. All the other ones really sucked. Um, and that was all on me, by the way. Uh, I did not give good answers. I talked about everything but WWE in terms of like, you know, is there, you know, will you guys be splintering characters off into television shows outside of WWE Raw and SmackDown? Uh, for whatever asinine reason, I complained to Shane about being unable to get Mets games at sports bars in L.A., Shane's like you. He's a Yankees fan. He could care less about, you know. <laughs> so it really, up until I, I talked to Vince, you know, that's finally when I like just said, you know what, I'm just, I'm not going to be trying to get a job here. I'm just going to be, you know, be myself, have it be relaxed. I told Vince stories of our Royal Rumble pools in college. And well, that's you know, what I wanted. I wanted to, I don't mean to cut you off, yeah. but I'm just, bef- I want to get into your meeting with Vince, but tell me at this point, 1999, what your level of wrestling fandom is. Are you a diehard? Are you watching it every week? Yeah. Casual it's fan. Little, it's a little bit of both because I was a diehard fan. Uh, you know, I was in the sweet spot. I was 12 years old during ro- the rock and wrestling era. Um, and, and growing up on Long Island where, you know, you had three live event shows a, a month um, or, or one a month. And I, I don't it was the Meadowlands Nassau Coliseum in the garden, right. I think, had monthly shows. And they were also on the MSG network where you can watch the house shows. Yeah. So I really got into it and I got into it. You know, uh, I was into it in college, m- probably more than the average person <laughs> because I was going to the live events at the Syracuse, you know, War Memorial and. We took road trips to WrestleManias 10 and 11, and I went to 12 as a fan. So you were um, a diehard. I was so a, a diehard. Yeah, I was a diehard. Um, Plus, by, and by 99, that's when we had the Attitude Era going, and that's when the popularity really started to 
go back up after that whole Hulk Hogan era. So now you get the meeting with Vince and tell me and tell me about that. Yeah, that's that's when, you know, I, I just let my fandom show, let my knowledge of WWE not trying to ask about, you know, potential for splintering off into sitcoms. And it ended very strangely because, you know, we hit it off. He said, we'll make you an offer you can't refuse and you'll come work for us. Um, but I refused the offer because the offer was for the website, um, was for WWE.com. And I wasn't going to drop everything out in L.A. To, to work for the website. No disrespect to the website. So I did refuse it. I went back. That's when I worked on the uh, aforementioned werewolf show. Um, and then I got a call. Uh, my roommate at the time told me that, hey, did you hear uh, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrara, who were the writers at WWE before they left the company to go to WCW? And I was like, I think I would know if something like that happened. Thanks. And I went shower to go to work. And then I got out of the shower and I got a message, one flashing message on my machine. And it was from WWE HR saying, hey, Brian, there's been a situation. Um, can you call us immediately, please? Because uh, things have changed and we have another offer for you. So that's when they then offered the role of television writer. Uh, and the Wolf Show had been, you know, been wrapped up or it's close to wrapping up. And so I figured, what the hell? So how jarring was the transition for you going from writing sitcoms to writing Monday Night Raw? Yeah, you know, it was pretty <laughs> jarring, to say the least, because, you know, the the process is just so different. Right. You know, you're working in a big room and, you know, you're, you're not, you know, other than I guess the only comp really being SNL, like you're not writing that night for the show. Um, you know, there's time, there's time to revise the script and make changes. It ta will take, you know, this was, a, you know, the Wolf Show, at least, was a single cam. So you shoot it over the course of many days, you know, an episode a week or whatever it is. Um, the process is so much different in the WWE as far as, you know, the show is on the air that night, live on Monday, and it doesn't go out because it's ready. It goes out because it's nine o'clock. You know, as, uh, as as they do to paraphrase the Tina Fey quote of SNL. Uh, and then we would, you know, at the time back then, before we had, you know, added on to the staff, we would wake up Tuesday morning, order breakfast, uh, get into Vince's suite and write Smackdown that morning um, with with we'd be lucky if one tenth of the show was written before we got into the suite. So you wrote both shows. You wrote Raw and Smackdown. Yeah, when I started, uh, you know, there, there were first of all, there were only two writers in addition to the McMahons, right. myself and Tommy Blacha, who, who had just come over himself from Conan. Um, so there really wasn't any choice. You know, it wasn't until, you know, probably at least two, three years, probably three years, like 2002, when, when we did, uh, you know, name the head writer and stuff, where we we had enough people where we could split the teams into two. And even then, it wasn't like it was a pure split because we would work on our respective shows during the week. Um, but when we were, we'd go to both TVs, you know, the writers would all go to Monday, we'd all go SmackDown to Tuesday. And when we were there, it wasn't like we would go like, oh, good luck. You know, we'd roll up our sleeves and work on that particular day's show. So you led me right into what I wanted to ask, what, what I wanted to ask next. Take me 2002, you're named head writer. So post that development. If you can give me sort of a sample of what your day to day, week to week was like writing those shows, what what was your Monday like? You gave me a little taste of Tuesday, but if you give me just a little bit on each day and how you built the process of writing the show until we get to Monday when that show kicks off, what was the week like for you in in those years, two thousand and two on? So those weeks were kind of like a. It wasn't Monday through Sunday. You know, in my brain, it was Wednesday through Tuesday because Wednesday you, you're finished with TV tapings and, and TV is what we called it. Uh, and now you're like clearing your brain. Hopefully there's some long term stuff that you've already been working on that could propel you into the next week. Oftentimes stuff changes or there are variables with people getting hurt and you're staring at a blank sheet of paper, basically, with hopefully some ideas, you know, but but either way. Um, you're getting your ideas down on paper. You're going, you know, I would do the reverse commute into Stanford. So I lived in uh, Gramercy Park at the time. Um, and you'd get together with your teams, respectively, uh, work on creating, you know, for Raw, it was like 11 segments. For SmackDown, it was 10. 
we would work on raw um we'd have our you know meeting with vince probably you know either thursday or friday uh, in the meantime we were you know just trying to come up with the show and and also keeping in mind the pay-per-view that's coming up because you have to you know be selling pay-per-views and be writing right. towards that you know to a lesser extent there was sunday night heat on mtv still as well so you have all those elements you you know you ultimately you have your meeting and in this you know there it varied uh, over the years but typically you know you'd have your meeting with vince you'd have to have your stuff in order by let's say a thursday meeting thursday in the afternoon um and then he would approve stuff vince would or not approve stuff and then you'd have to come up with alternates. You'd usually have to go into the meeting with alternates, a plan A, B, and C. Um, what was the sort of the percentage that he would approve and not approve each week? I mean, it varied, but, you know, we, we it, I didn't find myself in a situation coming out of those meetings where we were, you know, up a creek and had nothing. Very, very rarely would that happen. Usually we would work it out. You know, even if he didn't love it upon hearing it, we would start going back and forth as far as, well, what if we did it, but did it this way? Or what about that? And at the very least, we would come out of, you know, those meetings with the main event, the opening segment, what they called the crossover segment, which was the segment in the middle of the show that crossed over the uh, 10 o'clock hour uh, and a couple other things, you know, and it would be up to us then to fill in the rest then, you know, oftentimes during that time, we'd have a Saturday morning meeting over the phone where we'd go over the script with a fine tooth comb. And then it would be upon me to, like, take that meeting and do with a rewrite. There really weren't many days off. Right. Um, and then we would travel and then do the show Monday and Tuesday. All right. So you write a script Thursday, Friday. It goes to Vince. He t approves what he approves, gives you rewrites. Now, back then, it's totally different than now. Now, everyone tells you everything, every promo for every wrestler is scripted word for word. Back then, it wasn't. So what was your process? Now, let's say, you know, you have a, there's a segment with The Rock. How does it come about where you give him what the, I don't know if it, back then, if it was a script or what sort of an outline and maybe in like the Curb Your Enthusiasm vein, huh. but then how, did you, how do you then deal with the wrestler and what they have to say during a promo? Well, uh, first of all, and, I, and what I, their I input is, and what their input is on that. I'm curious. Sure. I don't know. You know, I, I think there was a time where it was word for word or at least pretty close to it. Now, I think that's loosening a little, which I think is great. Um, a lot of things are changing right now. Yeah. But even mm -hmm. before, you know, all the craziness and everything that happened, I think it was still trending in that direction. Okay. You know, for me, it would be you know, my process, especially the one, you know, working with Dwayne. And, and it, it's it's interesting because you know, writers are kind of like agents in a way, not in the wrestling agent way, but in the Hollywood agent way in which we have our clients. <laughs> we have right. the people that we're close to, the people that we're pushing, the people that we talk to on the phone. Um, and, you know, my client list, you know, included Rock and, and Kurt Angle and Chris Jericho and Edge and Christian, um, you know, and, and various others. And, you know, for, for someone like Rock, uh, you know, he wanted to eventize his promos. You know, he didn't want there was not, not that anyone would phone it in, but some people like Kurt Angle would be very comfortable, especially in the beginning of his career with you handing him a piece of paper, him reading it over. <laughs> That's funny. Um, is it OK if I said this instead of this? Yeah, Kurt, whatever you want. Great. Got it. Memorize it. I'm a machine. This is how I process this. Rock was totally different. You know, same with Jericho, same with McFoley, you know, Agent Christian as well, where it was much more of a collaboration. So I would be able to hit rock with like, what do you think of this area? And he's like, I, I either, you know, hopefully I like that area. Yeah, that's good. I want, what if I said this, this, and this, and I get his ideas, I'd write them down. I contribute my own ideas. And then often, you know, he would have a match anyway. So like work on your match, do work on all that stuff. I'll work on the promo. Let's meet back here in 45 minutes. Okay, great. And we do that and, you know, and then do the whole process again. Um, where it was very, very, very much and very key important for him to be able to, you know, have a lot of input and in say in it because he's got to be feeling it in order for it to be effective. Um, you know, the, the the key with Rock that, you know, made it slightly, I wouldn't say easier is not the right word, but from a time management standpoint better, is that he was fearless when it came to doing his promos live. He did not like to do them pre-taped. 
Uh, he liked to do it live. He liked to, you know, with the crowd so integral to his delivery and promo. If they're chanting his name, you know, he could take a pause and, and you know, yeah. acknowledge that. Or if he's a heel and they're, you know, chanting or booing or even laughing, don't laugh at the Rock's jokes. You know, it just has this different energy right. when it's live. And now, when, when you would work with him on on that would then Vince have to approve that? Or by that time, it's whatever you guys come up with. It's so close to showtime and he can go out there and do his thing. Yeah, it varied. Um, right. For the most part, you know, the most the, the highest praise you can get from Vince as a writer isn't this was a good promo. This was a bad promo. It's the words. I trust you. So when you had that and which I was fortunate enough to have that then you can kind of go off with rock, you know, or whoever, whatever talent and being like, all right, Vince knows, like, we're going to stay within this parameter. We're going to hopefully stay within this amount of time that's been allotted to the segment. Um, and we're going to go do the promo. And if there's any issue with it, you know, the, the, the worst thing you could hear is Vince wants to see you at gorilla position, but that was really never the case with the rock. Were you, did you write the, this is your life segment? So the well-known, famous "This Is Your Life" segment, yes, highest-rated well, segment ever, and all that stuff. Yeah, and... that well, that predated me. Okay. Oh, that was before '99. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was '98. Okay. Um, you do the reverse, the inverse of right. Rock doing it to Mick. Right. Uh, years later. Right. Right. Um, well, let me ask. You you mentioned Rock. You mentioned Mankind. Edge Christian. You didn't mention Stone Cold. Did you work closely with him, or was he he had his own deal? Because at that time he was white hot, obviously. Sure. I mean, so yeah. There's I, I dedicate a whole chapter in the book about you know my relationship with Stone Cold because Stone Cold is is, is a very very unique position and he's a very unique person. Like first of all, um, you know the literally I, I my first two TVs were November first and second. And when I got back home to Los Angeles, I got a call um, from the other writer, Tommy, saying that Steve needs to have surgery and he may never wrestle again. Um, and that's, you know, what precipitated that is what prompted the who ran over Stone Cold angle because he was essentially taken out at Survivor Series 99 that year and then was okay. off for many, many months. Um, you know, and when he came back the landscape had changed a little bit, not radically, but a little bit as far as like, you know, rock stepping up and rock triple H becoming, you know, more prominent players, even than when they were before and they were pretty prominent before. Um, and there was a very interesting, you know, dynamic with me having to, you know, Vince wanting Steve to do, you know, hit these certain points and everything. And Steve, who's never needed a writer in wrestling in his life, um, you know, being, you know, kind of approached by this very, very socially awkward, you know, at the time, 26, 27 year old, um, you know, with, hey, what do you want to say about this? And, you know, and I don't blame Steve at all. His perspective is like, who are you? What is this? How about we go to the method we did before where nobody told me to say anything and I made the company millions upon millions of dollars? How's that? How about that? Um, but, you know, one other key thing was that the company went public, you know, during that time, too. Right. right. That's when, like, you know, certainly the, the overall policy and Vince's policy was, um, you know, the, he'll give a little le leeway and trust in everything. But for for key promos and key moments, you know, he wanted to know what was going to be said and, uh, you know, what exactly, you know, we want to kind of like, you know, have that uh, knowledge of, of especially out in the ring. Um, of what was going to be said. And that's, you know, what kind of led to tension. You mentioned being 26, 27, right? Head writer, WWE. Did you find it difficult to get the respect of all the wrestlers? Did you find that obviously Stone Cold's a special case? He can tell you, listen, I'm going to do what I want. I'm not listening to you. But overall, was it diff did it take time for the wrestlers to trust you and, and, and warm up to your stuff? Or was it smooth sailing from the get go with the wrestlers? Yeah, well, it, it was definitely not smooth sailing from the get go. Um, it was smooth sailing for certain wrestlers, because, again, like you start to gravitate towards certain ones. You know, Edge and Christian, for example, you know, they were the they have great matches, but they don't really have personalities and promo time. You know, Edge was, you know, and, and Christian, they were in the brood. So they were kind of like smiling vampire people. And then they were just like having great match people but not distinct personalities uh and we're all again we're all the same age we were born the same year uh and you know they kind of looked at me 
as a like, oh, this is kind of like I would probably dare I say maybe even be friends with this person if, uh, you know, we weren't all working together and, and See, movies and taste. So, you know, so we, we basically, you know, th those are examples of the younger ones being able to kind of much smoother than, you know, in certain cases needing to prove yourself to the more established people. What's interesting to me is obviously there was no bigger star than The Rock and Edge and Christian were enormously successful and popular. I would think other wrestlers would see that and say, oh, you know, they're working with Brian. Maybe I should give this a shot. You know, you would think that would convince them maybe. Well, you know, a lot of it is on me, honestly, because you, you get into, you know, a comfort zone. And you get into like, oh, all right, I'm going to work with my guys. I'm going to work with Angle. I'm going to work with Jericho. And there are people, now granted, there are people that are like, who the hell is this kid? I don't need him. And then there are other people who are like, the hell is this guy's deal? He just works with his buddies and he doesn't, he's too good to work with someone else. Um, you know, if this guy's a supposed like wonder kid, like why, why isn't he working with me? What the hell? So there's heat from that perspective too. And it's really, you know, again, this would be a much different story, you know, if I were writing in 2022 as opposed to 2002 or even earlier, where, you know, now with with age and confidence and experience, um, there's not as much like, well, I just want to stay in my comfort zone versus now, which would be, yeah, whoever is here, let's work with them and that kind of thing. All right. Let me ask you about some specifics. We could do this sort of in, in a rapid fire way, just specific storyline. Well, let me ask you this, because I screwed up one thing already with This Is Your Life. Were you the head writer when they did the angle where it looked like Kurt and Stephanie were going to have some sort of relationship while she was with Triple H? Or was that before you? No, that was I was one of the main proponents of uh, the tr love triangle. OK, my biggest beef in all of wrestling when it comes to storylines that got dropped that I thought had the best potential was that one. Why did it get dropped? Because I thought there was major chemistry between Kurt and Stephanie, and maybe that was the problem. But so, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put on my defensive wrestling hat uh, over okay. my Mets hat and and say, technically speaking, right? Um, you know, and and th th there was you know it wasn't dropped so much as it was ended rather unceremoniously because there was a match between Kurt and Triple H where That's Stephanie dropped. quote unquote had to choose and she ultimately chose Triple H and then you know it didn't continue from there there you know I think you know these angles are 20 years old now I don't think it's like speaking out of school you know the issue with that love triangle thing is that you're Kurt you're moving in on a married woman in the storyline wise and if you're Triple H you're going to be de facto the baby face. If you really take it to its natural conclusion, I'm going to kick the ass of this guy who's like trying to make out with my wife. And, you know, at the time he did not want to be a baby face. So but was, I see, I got the sense that everyone was rooting for maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was just me, but I was rooting for Kurt in that story. <laughs> well, it, yeah, you know, it's interesting. Everyone's got a different, you know, perspective on it. I know right. like ultimately, you know, if you if you were rooting for Kurt and, and granted Kurt back then, he was goofy, likable, funny. Triple H was, you know, serious and, you know, had, had done a lot of dastardly things, you know, as a heel at that point. Uh, it could be very easy to root for Kurt on, on the surface. You know, just taking the names out of it. It's a non-married man moving in on another man who is not mistreating his wife or anything. You know, he's the heel on paper at least. Um, and yeah, it was just, uh, it, it, that's one of the things is the talent needs to be comfortable, especially top talent with right. where it's going. And if they're not, then you're going to get stuff that ultimately, all right, we'll do the match and then we'll forget about it. And yeah, it could leave a sour taste in people's mouth. That's just, it's fun. It's, I'm glad I got to talk to the person behind that because I just, it's funny that I look at it completely the opposite way. <laughs> like I was rooting for Kurt the whole time. And, you know, I don't look at it like the guy's going after the married guy's wife because it's wrestling and yeah. it's not happening in real life. So like I would, you know, and you have Kurt there drinking the milk and being a, you know, nerdy goober type. And you wanted to see him triumph over the bully. That was how I looked at it. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. But you know what? It is wrestling. But you know yeah. what? You know, um, one year after the angle, Stefan Hunter did get married in real life. So right. It, yeah. That, um, 
Give me your favorite thing that you've written, storyline, angle, top moment for you. You know, it's interesting. Like, there's like different, like I have favorite promos and favorite moments. I think my favorite long-term storyline was probably the Chris Jericho, Shawn Michaels angle uh, that lasted close to eight months. And, you know, it covered summer slams. It covered, you know, pay-per-views. It went had so much nuance to it um, because for me, especially someone who was seen as a sitcom writer, quote unquote, comedy guy slash Hollywood guy, you know, it was very important for me to, to establish that like, no, I could write money making dramatic angles as well. Um, and especially satisfying because Shawn Michaels was one of those people that, you know, he was gone for a while because of his back injury. He came back and I wasn't particularly close with him and he wasn't particularly close with me. And it's like, all right, if you're going to do this, you need to break out of your, you know, little comfort zone, work with Sean. He's not going to bite you um, and work with him and Chris. And, you know, obviously I did that. And, you know, that that angle, especially with us just all sitting down every week, all three of us contributing that to me uh, was was probably the most satisfying. You said you have favorite promos. What would those be if you want to name a couple? I mean, I love anytime, you know, the, the era of heel rock in 2003. Because we always talked about it when Rock was a babyface. Well, you know, we would be putting the promos together, and I'd say something intentionally heelish that, of course, that character could never say, just to pop, you know, Dwayne, just to right. get him to laugh. And he right. would, go, oh my God, I swear, if I was a heel, that would be perfect. Were so, you the man behind the rock concerts when he did? There was one he did. Um, he had that famous one in, in Sacramento. Yes, I forgot the line. Would come back and kick the lay uh, something about it was something like um with the lakers was, kansas and, city that song kansas city right right sacramento sacramento i won't stay but right. you know i'll come back when the lakers beat the kings in kings may. in may yeah, yeah that's a great one yeah just, so you, yeah. you and and he did um well the vicky guerrero one was he a heel or face at that point? I guess he's he was a face, a face at that he's point. Because I mean, he's saying heel things, but he's a face <laughs> at that point, which is interesting. Well, and there was another. Oh, the was so, there a rock concert with Stone Cold? There were, yeah. So there yeah. was there was the Sacramento one. Maybe that was the same one when when Steve, you know, right. smashed the Willie Nelson guitar. There right. was Vicky Guerrero, and Vicky, right. you know, was such a great sport, and and so, you know, I've never seen someone so like willing to go get insulted. It. Yes, as far yeah. as being a heel. And she's so sweet in real life. Yeah. Um, and then there was the one that was right in the height of the Roxena, uh, you know, WrestleMania angle. Oh, where, right, 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 right. Yeah, where where it was a big, you know, thing in Cleveland where John cut a rap earlier. Rock had the rock concert later in the show. Neither guy knew what the other one was going to say. This was like as real as real could be because, you know, and there's a chapter on it in the book, too, because, you know, real life tension had kind of seeped into the angle or vice versa. Right. So, you know, that was satisfying to work on as well. Give me, I don't know if this is in the book and uh, the book is, there's just one problem out next week. Everyone can check it out. Give me the angle or storyline. You may have pitched more than once repeatedly to Vince that he kept shooting down that you wish would have happened. I got to think about that. Um, it's such a great question and it's something, you know, that I should have, uh, you know, should have had, there was a lot of what ifs, you know, in, in WWE, you know, obviously all of us during the time of the invasion angle, real, it's not our money. So it's easy for us to say, but obviously we all wanted the top stars to come to the company. We wanted the top stars from WCW, I should say. So it was like, how can we do an invasion angle if we don't have, Goldberg, Ric Flair, Hulk Hogan, Nash, Hall, Sting, Steiner, right. all that type of stuff. Um, you know, so obviously we were pushing for that, but it was kind of out of our hands from a contractual standpoint because those guys were getting paid guaranteed money um, and we just couldn't come. Um, you know, there was certainly, um, you know, on the flip side, I'm trying to think. Uh, Let me just ask, since you brought up just to follow up, did you help Heyman at all with that famous promo he did? Um about the you know during the invasion angle about when he when he just tears up Vince in that very long promo, you know I think there was a promo with Heyman and, and Vince. There's also a promo with Heyman Bischoff and Vince. 
And I think in those particular cases, I might have been the writer assigned to that promo. But those guys are such pros that it all came from them. Yeah, I ask because I, I don't see Heyman taking help from people writing promos because he's obviously so good at it on his own. But I was, well, was, I was just wondering what head that relation too. Right. You know, the head writer That's right. I was the head writer of Raw. That's so, right. That's right. Yeah, he didn't need, you know, he's so talented. He did definitely, especially when this very, very weird thing that only happens in wrestling where it's the character of Paul Heyman, who happens to be played by Paul Heyman, cutting a promo on actual unscripted real life things that happened to Paul Heyman. Right. So that especially is something that only Paul Heyman could uh, could come up with. And I want to I want to transition to the Young Rock show. There was an announcement yesterday in the book. And um, so just quickly on this, the Vince retirement, were you stunned? And what do you think? the outcome is going to be here with the company with triple H in charge of creative. So, yeah, I mean, look, it's a kind of an out of body experience, you know, watching all these things. It's surreal to watch it all unfold, you know, cause I was a part of it for so long. Um, but you know, at the bottom line is not to all of a sudden turn into Austin. Um, you know, I think, I think the company, you know, and I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. I think the company is in a, is always been in the mindset of a, all right, you know, this this person is gone who's going to step up you know it's always like that when a talent either you know unfortunately gets hurt or has to retire or go off to hollywood whatever it is you know we knew when rock was going to leave uh to go to hollywood in 2003 the wwe would still be on, the, be on the air you know when john cena left to go to hollywood the wwe would still be you know on the air every single week um and it's the same thing in this case it's like okay vince is gone they're not going to be start playing the best of Raw and SmackDown for the next five months until they, you know, come up with a plan. It's like right. you have a show next week and arguably the next week's show is the most important show uh, that you could possibly have. So I know it's very much, I think, and it permeates on down this attitude of, all right, now's my time to either excel or fall flat on my face, but I'm not going to sit back and do anything other than give like the 100 percent maximum effort in order to uh, knock it out of the park. And I think, you know, the the circumstances aside for a second, just looking at it strictly from a creative television standpoint, um, I think there's a lot of rolling up the sleeves and salivating and like, let me tear into this because now I have this opportunity, whereas before I was kind of at the mercy of whether like, you know, this one person with one mindset would either give a thumbs up or thumbs down. Now that dynamics changed, uh, and I'm talking about, you know, from Triple H on down, because there's so many talented writers there, uh, many of whom I don't know, many of them I do, who were working when I was working, that have a lot of ideas and a lot of different philosophies and stuff that I think they see this as a golden opportunity to uh, take the ball and run with it. Now, see, I I'm sort of of the belief, and I'm sure you don't want to hear this, and I, and I mean this in actually a way where I'm sympathetic with anyone who's writing WWE television right now. I, I sort of think it's almost impossible to create anything today that is going to be as good as it was when you were writing it. And before that, with the attitude era, simply for the reason of social media, the internet, it's impossible to keep things quiet. It's impossible to keep storylines quiet and secret. And, uh, and it seems that the real life stuff is what wrestling fans care about more than the on-screen stuff. So I think writing WWE right now, you're in such a, I'm not saying things can't be good and creative. We've seen it. It, it happens, but I'm talking about, it seems like nothing ever will get a wrestling fan interested in anything more than a surprise. And it's so hard to do surprises these days. Is, is that a fair statement? I mean, I think it's fair as far, like, first of all, you never know. Like, you know, there's, there's, there's still ways for, you know, both AEW and WWE to surprise an audience. The, you know, the internet and the, um, you know, what, however many different ways things can be spoiled it certainly doesn't help as far as, you know, creating true surprise moments. But I mean, I don't know, we created surprise moments, even in the age of, uh, you know, some forms of social media, um, you know, when John Cena returned to the Royal Rumble, um, even when Rock returned to be the host of Monday Night Raw, you know, granted, that was like in the early stages of Twitter, I think it was probably right. like 2009 or 2010. Um, but we managed to do it. Well, well, and it's sort of a trade-off because let's say, you know, The Rock was going to do an episode of Monday Night Raw. He had a movie to promote and he says, I'm going to come on Raw. I understand why the WWE would want to promote that a, a week in advance, pump it up, get everyone knowing, blah, blah, blah. On the flip side, 
could you imagine watching Monday Night Raw one night and out of nowhere there's The Rock? I mean, people would just completely lose their freaking mind. So it didn't happen, you know, that long ago. As far as you know, his appearance at WrestleMania 31, um, which I write about in the book too, that was all the way on the West Coast. He had hosted Saturday Night Live right the, the night before. Um, and w- nobody knew he was coming in terms of the audience. Was that the one with Ronda Rousey? Yeah, that was the one with Ronda. I feel like people knew that was coming. No, I don't. Maybe I I'm think wrong. They did. Okay. I, I, especially because, if anything, I saw the opposite saying Rock's hosting SNL in New York City. Oh, okay. So, right, right, right. I you got know, you. Take him out of the WrestleMania right. equation. Right. Uh, you know, there were other cases where, yeah, you could WrestleMania 30, you know, it's this big anniversary seminal moment. You could probably, you know, predict and or hope that, you know, he would be there. You don't necessarily know how he's going to be used. Um, but in that particular case, yeah, we did SNL. You know, I was there with him, obviously. We we got on, we went to the after party. We got on a plane at two o'clock in the morning, uh, landed in, you know, San Francisco, you know, area, and then went to the arena like four hours later or whatever it was. You know, I think it's just, I, I do remember specifically sometime in 2005, you know, the, this mindset of like, we went from, you know, the Saturday morning shows, WWF superstars, and then occasionally a Saturday night's main event, and then occasionally a pay-per-view at WrestleMania, then four pay-per-views a year, then 12 pay-per-views a year, then two shows instead of one show. And thinking in 2006, like, they've seen it. The audience has seen everything. What else could we possibly do? Right. And that was, you know, now you're talking 16 years ago, and yet there's still things you could do. I've never seen Brock Lesnar drive a tractor and over you know tilt the ring like he right. did at SummerSlam a couple of weeks ago um you know so i would say like and especially now in this era in this like new environment you know from a creative standpoint i'm curious to see if everyone you know rises to the challenge and is able to create something that you know invigorates the audience and is different and you know has people like i honestly don't know what the hell they're going with and what's going to happen type feeling again um I want to have you plug the book and tell us what we can expect in it, but let's talk about The Rock here for a minute because obviously you have a relationship with The Rock. I'm going to try to be professional here because I (laughs) have a man crush on The Rock. He follows me on Twitter. I put it in my bio. Um, Do you work? You're you're working on the Young Rock series. You're writing for that on NBC. There was a deal announced this week with A and E, which does a great job with those. Uh, series that they're doing where you're going to do the territories, the Young Bucks company, and that's that's obviously you and Dwayne. Tell me just about, you guys clicked right away and then he brought you into the, co- how did this all develop with Dwayne Johnson? Yeah, it was, you know, starting from that meeting in 99 uh, in, at the Meadowlands at MTV where he saw, you know, he's one of these guys that he's a star, but you know, his attitude is if this person, whether it's a me, you know, back in 99 or whether it's a script in Hollywood right now uh, or a director he's never worked with, like, I don't know you, but if you're talented and you could help me and we click, then let's do it. You know, I'm not like he's, he's a very grounded person and, and a realist and, you know, willing to give people chances to prove themselves. So that that relationship, you know, started then it cultivated. It went through, you know, whenever even when he left wwe initially you know if he was you know he hosted something called the world stunt awards um this was like an award for all the stunt men and women uh out and on the paramount lot so he brought me on you know to be the writer for that two years in a row you know if he was at the time you know now he does it effortlessly in his sleep if he was going on tonight show uh or or presenting at the oscars even it's like hey what do you think we could do here you know again not like write me something but more like you know let's collaborate like we do at WWE, Um, you know, and that just kind of went a long way towards then him saying, I'm starting my own production company. Uh, I'd like you to be a part of it. You know, at that point, I was really ready to move on to something else. Uh, So, yeah. So now we got Young Rock on NBC. We've got Tales from the Territories coming out on Vice uh, on October 4th. Oh, Vice. I'm sorry. I said A&E. It's My part bad. of the A&E network. So it's okay. All- okay. I, yeah. There's so um, many good wrestling things. But they both yeah. do a great job. Vice and A&E. Both the Vice yeah. ones are great. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we'll have a ton of, you know, projects in development and projects on the air. But, you know, wrestling is in both our DNAs to an extent. So we're always going to be, you know, have a special place in our heart for various wrestling and wrestling related projects. So we have these two and, you know, you might be seeing more in the future. Now, is it 
do you have a personal relationship with him as well? Is it strictly business or, I mean, you know, do you call him if like the Miami Hurricanes, I mean, text him if the Miami Hurricanes, you know, either like get embarrassed or win a big game or something like that? I, you know, I went to Syracuse. He was, you know, at my, he's one year older than me. So he played at Miami. Like I literally was booing the hell out of him in the carrier dome when Miami came and stopped us in our own stadium, my freshman year, his sophomore year, um, you know, without knowing who he was at the time. Um, so yeah, like we, we finally, we finally, you know, recall those days or as he recalls them as Miami whooping Syracuse's ass every year. Right. Um, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but yeah, you know, like it's not mm -hmm. strictly, you know, you, if you work with someone so closely for over 20 years, um, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, Hey, here is the latest, you know, work related thing. Um, you know, I was, I was, uh, you know, at a store and I ended up getting some, uh, Funko pop doll thing with the rock and scene at WrestleMania. So, you know, I took a picture and texted it to him I'm like, Hey, I just, so you know, I'm totally buying this. You know, it's like, you know, one of those things where, you know, we get my question is how long does it take for him to write back? Because he's got like, 78 jobs so i would imagine he it takes him a while to text back when someone even if his closest friends are texting him he's just seems like the busiest human on earth you know it's amazing yeah. there's a lot of people that we deal with you know on the seven buck sides of things where i find myself saying how is it that i can get an answer from the rock the busiest man alive <laughs> right. way quicker than it is to yeah. get a response from you so yeah obviously it's easier when he's not on set and not shooting a movie um, right. you know, cause he could be gone for hours upon hours, but yeah, it is pretty yeah. quick response. That's good to hear. All right. Tell us before I let you go, the book, give us a little synopsis, what we, we, what we can expect and what's in the book for WWE fans. When you were, when you, uh, give us a little rundown of when you were writing for the company, 1999 to 2012, obviously peak year there for the WWE. Yeah. So, you know, I, I kind of, I'd like to think it kind of connects with people on two levels because on one hand, it's a story of an outsider, you know, coming in to this strange new world, kind of like an Alice in Wonderland type thing where he's a big fan and, and but has no idea what the hell he's stepping into, um, you know, and just that journey of like how this outsider all of a sudden not only entered the WWE, but was, you know, by default put in a position of enormous influence and power as far as writing the shows and, and influencing, you know, what angles and storylines got on the air. Um, and on another level, you know, it's, you know, a lot of stories uh, behind the scenes, never really told before stories from an era that hasn't really been explored all that much. You know, there's been plenty of stuff, you know, written and spoken of and seen on television of the attitude era. Um, and I was fortunate to be there for like the, you know, the waning year or two of it. But the vast majority of my experience was the ruthless aggression era, the PG era, the guest host era, segueing, you know, into the reality era, if you want to call it that. So there's a lot of like cool moments that really have never been touched upon before that, you know, I was fortunate enough to experience firsthand and then write about. I'm not going to lie. I was kind of glad I saw you started there in 99 because I didn't want to have to go through the Montreal screw job again, <laughs> which was in 97. No, but um, I will say this. It was, yeah. you know, like, a, you know, in terms of favorite promos, I was very, very, you know, I didn't think about it much at the time because I just had to do the job. But to be able to be the quote unquote writer of like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, recon, you know, the reconciliation. That, that was big. Had, yeah. Um, yeah, that was you know, and again, they contributed so much to it and it all came a lot of it from the heart. I was more of like almost a manager. Um, but it was, yeah, it was just really as a fan, just thrilling to see that, you know, come yeah. up. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to reading the book and I thank you for coming on and uh, tell Dwayne I said hello. <laughs> I will. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Brian. Be well. Take care. All right. Joining me now, as he does every week for the Train of Thought segment, my buddy from WFAN in New York, SNY TV in New York, Sal Akata. Sal, how's it going? Good. You? Where are you going? Going with a beard? No, just, uh, yeah, I normally have this. It's probably a little thicker. Than, it's a little uh, thicker. Yeah. I probably too at some point. Too busy it. celebrating the Mets winning four out of five against the Braves <laughs> to shave. Is that what it is? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. No, I'm lucky I, I have time to do anything. Uh, I'll probably shave this weekend when I actually have some time. Between the DVR, shaving, I got to catch up on a bunch of different things. Here. You what? Which game were you at this weekend? I know you went to... Sunday, the, the DeGrom game on Sunday. So that was the game where the Edwin Diaz 
entrance went viral. Correct. Give me, yeah. give us. I saw you write so about, I, I yeah. right about that. I was shocked. I didn't even know it had 500 million views or whatever it was, 5 million views. What did it yeah. get? I think it was like five. The video, I think, had 5 million views when I saw it. I wrote about it in Monday's Train of Thoughts, but give me a little feel of what it was like, what it's like being in the ballpark when Edwin Diaz comes out to that music and the trumpets and all that. It's great. And I'm not somebody who was ever a huge Diaz fan for obvious reasons. He wasn't ever any good. Um, and I usually don't, I mean, it's different. I never experienced Mariano and, and hearing Enter Sandman uh, from a Yankees fan's perspective. I experienced it and there was a feel to it. This is, I don't know, man, it's special. I didn't really think about it the one the moment. I'm thinking, okay, well, the Mets are about to bury the Braves here and go win the National League East, put them, you know, win four out of five. And then after watching that video back on SNY that they tweeted out, I thought, um, you know, I, I realized how special that it's become. The song, I think, plays well for it. That's obviously. what it is. Yeah, it's the, so the, the, the build up to it, then the trumpets. It's more celebratory, right. you know, where Enter Sandman may be, uh, uh, you know, intimidating or like just a different feel with the, with this type of song it's more of a celebratory atmosphere and diaz strikes everybody out so it is a, it, it also you know, plays different. it also plays better um on video than at the ballpark all right next topic moving on here in train of thoughts we are taping this tuesday afternoon the debut of hard knocks is tuesday night Will you be into Hard Knocks? Will you make it a point to watch it? Detroit Lions, uh, looks like Dan Campbell's going to be the breakout star, I'm sure, head coach. Where, what is your level of excitement for Hard Knocks? Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, my level of excitement is probably a 4. Now, remember, I'm extremely busy with multiple jobs and everything else, although tonight I do have some free time. I will be tempted to check it out. Plus, I saw somebody tweet about uh, Hutchinson is – singing Michael Jackson, which maybe get me to look. I'll, I'll give it a shot. And I still love this show. But last year, I got I didn't get into it at all. And me too. Yeah, I don't know why that is. I'm, I'm sad that I don't love it because it used to be part of the buildup to football season. So I'll give it a shot. And hopefully the first episode makes me uh, interested in it and I, I yeah. stick with it. I mean, I'm a broken record on this. I've said it a billion times. Social media heard hard knocks a lot because we see all the stuff during the week. It's interesting because I do feel like it used to be on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Now it's Tuesdays. It feels like it's it's weird to me that it's Tuesday. It's like a little or I used to like it as sort of like get me into the week of football. So that's why I liked it on a Thursday because then you're getting set up. But they have to do things differently, I think, now because of social media. I was not into it at all last year like you. I'm looking forward to it this year. I'll definitely watch it tonight, and I, I, I think Dan Campbell's a big, a big reason why. Now, I've said this, too, and, you know, it's blasphemy to say this. You know, all that rah-rah bullshit is fine, and, you know, we're going to walk, run through a wall, and I'll die for you guys, and we'll give it 150 million percent. All that's good, but when you don't know how many timeouts there are in the fourth quarter, and you don't know when to call timeout, and you don't know when to go for it, all that rah rah bullshit is useless. But I'll get into the show. Yeah. But that coaching is coaching during the games is much different than all the motivational stuff you do in practice. But no one seems to care about that. And we saw um, that we we saw it kind of with Rex Ryan, and I know his team. You know, the, he took the Jets to back to back AFC championships. Yeah. But he was more of a rah rah guy and a, a blowhard than he was a good coach. He wasn't right. a, a, a good head coach by the you know the, the way you coach a game in game. But anyway, I, I'm with right. you. I think that's yeah. overblown. Uh, we also have this week on Thursday is the Field of Dreams baseball game on Fox. Now, last year was the Yankees and White Sox did a huge rating. People were into it. Now this year it's the Cubs and Reds. Will you have any interest in that? Uh, no. I mean, I, I like this the scene. Uh, I like the idea of miking certain players up, you know, at the same time. I guess possibly, but come on, could you come up with a worse matchup than that? Yeah, I, I have zero interest in this. I think the novelty is worn off. They did it already. Obviously, I'm a Yankee fan. The Yankees, you know, they ended up losing that game. But listen, th would I put it on for five minutes to just to check out the scene the uniforms, what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Am I lasting more than five minutes, lasting more than an inning? Cubs Reds in the middle of August? No. Right. Um, I will say I want to give one recommendation for things for uh, on something for people to watch. I tweeted this, but I want to say it here. 
Um, it came out maybe a month ago. It's an ESPN. It's not a 30 for 30. It was an E60. It's one of those E60. I don't know the differences between the 30 for 30 and the E60. I mean, it's two different comp, you know, branches of ESPN, but it's called The Great Imposter and Me. You would love it. It would what be right up your alley. So I don't want to give a ton of spoilers, but it's about this guy who used to finagle his way into massive sporting events and get on the field, on the, uh, you know, on the court, everywhere. He was at the, he, he, it starts out where he ends up in the layup line at the NBA all-star game in uniform. (laughs) You know, he, he ends up getting into the MLB all-star game. Um, There's a big incident. I think it's at the Emmy awards, which I don't want to spoil. Okay. And then halfway through, it takes a wild left turn on something you would have never seen coming. And uh, it was like, I think it's an, like an hour and a half, hour and 20 is, minutes. Is it on demand? I can watch it ESPN on ESPN demand. Plus. ESPN okay. Plus. Oh, okay. Well, you fun. would love it. Um, uh, this is what I would say to people. And it's a one-off. It's not a series. So it's, you know, you need something to watch one day. You're not looking to get into like a regular series. You just need a one-off. It's perfect. Uh, the, the great imposter in me... Uh, Jeremy Schapp is a big part of it and his dad Dick Schapp factors into it Um, and it would be right up your alley and this is what I would say to people don't go looking up spoilers like to see if you would be into it like you got to go into it fresh okay it's it's really good it's really good I'll check Uh, it out now yeah Um, yeah so that was I wanted to get and another I we I talked about this last week with Alan Seppenwall I don't think you're watching it but I don't think you would like it, but the rehearsal on HBO is the one of the weirdest. But and I mean, I mean that in a good way. Shows like if you like like the Sasha Baron Cohen stuff and Andy Kaufman and th- that kind of thing, hmm. the rehearsal is I recommend it. But it's bizarre. Okay, I don't but know. I know you're not. Yeah, yeah you're, you're too busy right now. I mean, I got I still got to finish the impeachment. I told you about that. I don't know if it was last week or a couple of weeks ago. My, we're on the final episode. We haven't had time to watch it. I got Better Call Saul on the DVR. I mean, I'm falling asleep, missing shows here. I, I'm a mess right now. You tell me to watch these shows. Do, we heard so they may not be any good. I don't know. You know, I should have asked you this beforehand off the air, but do do we want to talk about you falling asleep or oh Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, okay, let me just let me just set this up because I love this story. <laughs> so Sal's a diehard, huge Met fan. The Mets went four to five from the Braves, basically put away the AL, the NL East. And I do, and I would place a wager right now on the Mets to win a World Series because you're just banking on those two pitchers being healthy. Anyway, they get the fourth out of fifth game on Sunday. Sal's got to go on the radio here in New York on WFAN at two a.m. for his overnight shift, and he's all pumped up to talk about the Mets. And he oversleeps. What time did now? You were supposed to be on at two. What time did you end up getting on the air? Do you do you freaking believe that? I mean, I just no, I don't believe it. I taped a great open, you know, like the mocking the Braves, Tom Hawk Chop song, and all that stuff. I go take my normal nap like I would. Now remember, I had that Sweet Sixteen that I'm driving three hours there, three hours back on Sunday. I go to the game with twelve different callers, uh, you know, to to go hang hold out. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me get. Oh, hold on. You went to a Sweet 16 Sunday afternoon before the Met game. No, then you- Saturday night. I went Saturday night but drove home because it was in Philadelphia. Drove home Sunday morning. Had like gotta, an hour home. I had to pick the dog up from my mother's house. Whatever. No excuses. All right. So Saturday the- night, yeah. Sweet 16 in Philadelphia. Sunday you go to the Mets game. Correct. This is what I want to know. I want to know, what time did you fall asleep for your nap? I would say like 10.30. Which 10.30 p.m. Gonna- yeah, usually on a Sunday night it's nine thirty, but because I got home from the game at nine thirty and I wanted to tape that open, I ended up going to sleep around ten thirty PM. And you were supposed to be on the air at two AM. When did you wake up? Two fifty seven AM in a panic. Now I woke up at one oh seven to go to the bathroom. I checked my phone, I was like, All right, I got like twenty five minutes, half hour, whatever, I'm good to go. I set my multiple alarms like I do every single time I do this, and I don't know what happened. I woke up and one of, the, it's that, one of those nightmares I, that you've had happen all the time. Like I always envision this and dread it, which is why you can't sleep in those spots. Well, because you're worried about waking up. I wake up, I look at the phone, I see 257. I was like, oh my God. Oh the my panic God. Att- I can't imagine the panic attack. 
Yeah. But here's the thing. You know, I love you, but I got to say you did a bad job here. For, you told me one thing there that makes me think you did a bad Because anyone can oversleep. Anyone can oversleep. Everyone, you know, sometimes your alarm right. messes up. I got all that. You're on a crazy schedule. You would do. You did six to ten in the morning last week. Now you're doing two. Right. You woke up at one o seven to pee and went back to sleep. That's a bad. That you should not have done. Well, That's a my, bad. You got to be on the air at two. If my alarm is set for one thirty or no. one forty, what's the difference? Because I'll tell you what the difference is, and I want the listeners to weigh in here on Twitter when you hear this. When you wake up from a nap. You go back for a double dip, you, that second nap fucks you up. That's a fact. Yeah. You can't do a second nap in a row back to back like that. That puts you in that state where you don't, you're like catatonic. You don't know where you are. So if you got up at 107 to pee and you had to be on the air at two and you went back for a couple of extra minutes. Yeah, job, and I don't know. Like, I wonder in that state if I shut the alarm off. I, I don't know what happened. but the I know. I think I know off. what happened. When you go back for that second back-to-back -back nap you go into a deeper it knocks you the hell out you were you were in a coma you didn't know where you were yeah apparently Bad job, buddy. Um, um all right terrible. last thing here before we wrap i'm a i'm a couple of years older than you but for me my first two crushes in life were marcia brady and olivia newton john at the end of greece did you have the olivia newton john affection that a lot of people my age did no, I loved uh, Grease, though. One of my all-time favorite movies as a kid. I remember watching it hundreds of times. I had the soundtrack. I played the soundtrack yesterday driving home from work. Um, but I think I was too young to have a crush. I go to uh, Candace Cameron was my first crush. Oh, and um, and uh, Tatiana Ali. Those are the two that I remember. So maybe that's a little bit later. But yeah. I, I loved Grease and I loved Olivia Newton-John. So you were, you were too... Brady Bunch wasn't in your wheelhouse when you were a kid, or was it? I, I watched it, but again, I think too young to have the crush. The first crush I ever remember was Can Candace Cameron, 100% from Full House. Um, and then, like I said, from Fresh Prince, Satyana Ali. Those right. are the first two that I remember right. like being in love with as a, you know, as a yeah. young kid, whatever. The other ones I, I watched, but I was probably too young for that. Someone had a great tweet um, after the sad, sad passing of Olivia Newton-John, just 73, about... Um, when at the end of Greece, when she ends up in the leather outfit and the curly hair, tell me about it, stud, that that was the first heel turn they ever remember. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great line. All right, Sal, I appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for coming on. All right, talk to you later. All right, all right, bye. All right, my thanks to Linda Cohen, Brian Gewertz, and Sal Licata for joining me on this episode. If you missed any recent episodes, go into the archives and check them out. Last week was our 400th episode. And we also spoke to Alan Suppenwall, the chief television critic for Rolling Stone, about what you should be watching this summer. Uh, John O'Ran was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, along with wrestling writer Dave Meltzer. Peter Schrager was on three weeks ago, so check those out. Leave a review on Apple, and we will read it most likely next week during the Train of Thought segment right here on the SI Media Podcast. All right. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Be well. Stay safe. Take care. We'll see you next week.